Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Mozart's marvelous music for wind ensemble. Don't you wish it began with an M? The alliteration just went flying out the window there. Well, it happens, you know, that's the world of classical music. Nothing is ever consistent for very long. That's for damn sure. Anyway, Mozart was the world's greatest master of music for wind ensemble, mostly because it's Mozart, but also because he had such an ingenious ear for sonority, for blending colors, for writing for wind instruments. And he learned it over the course of his all too brief career from his early days in Salzburg, all the way up until his years in Vienna. Now, Mozart's wind music is a huge mess, really, all the wind music by the great composers is a huge mess. Haydn's wind music is even more of a mess. There's a lot of early music by Haydn for wind ensembles, but you know, nobody knows what it is. This is the this is the issue. Most of these pieces were written for occasional use. Really occasional use, like weddings and bar mitzvahs. Well, maybe not so many bar mitzvahs, but you know, consecrations and and baptisms and outdoor festivities. And, you know, it was considered to be expendable music. Nobody, nobody thought to save it, except when Mozart later on in his career started writing huge masterpieces. And even those weren't published in his lifetime. You know, it was really, it's really very, very interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the bottom line with Mozart is that his wind music generally Generally, the part, the stuff that we really care about, there's a lot of spurious stuff. There's a lot of, you know, arrangements of like, you know, things from the operas for wind ensembles, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. But the actual pieces he wrote for wind ensemble that we know about fall into three broad categories. These are two divertimenti divertimenti being, you know, just sort of multi-movement fun pieces um, for, you know, any sort of, in any sort of structure or type. Um, there are two of the really, really early ones for 10 wins. You can sort of separate them out by the ensemble they're written for. The 10 wins in being pairs of oboes, bassoons, clarinets, English horns, and horns. The oboes, bassoons, clarinets, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Five times two is 10, right? Last time I checked, yeah. Oboes, clarinets, bassoons, horns, English, yeah. 10 of them. Those are the divertimenti Kerschel 166 and 186. That's that batch. The next batch he wrote in Salzburg, and there are five of them. And I'm not even going to go, I mean, they have all these crazy Kerschel numbers and things. It's rather, rather hard to figure out which ones they are specifically. But I think I actually have a list here. Let me see if I can do this. Um, they would be, let's see, well, Kerschel, 213, 240, 253, 270. And there's like one other one, 253. Yeah, no, I did 253, 252. That's, those are I'll sort of called the Salzburg divertimenti. And those are for wind sextet. And it's easier to think of them as wind sextets and not worrying about crucial numbers and things like that, because they, uh, one of the difficulty in identifying them, I think, is one of the things that's prevented them from achieving the popularity that they deserve. But the sextets are written for simply two oboes, two horns, and two bassoons. And Mozart's writing for this combination really is extraordinary. And it set up that whole sort of later school of, of wind ensemble writing by composers like Cromer, you know, the great Czech wind people, they all came later um, in the in the in the 18th and, and, and early, uh, I'm sorry, in the 17th, no, 18th, 18th, 18th and early 19th centuries from the, you know, the 1780s, 90s, etc. And, you know, the reason that sextet was such a popular, popular ensemble was that it was relatively inexpensive and every self-respecting aristocrat had to have a wind ensemble. Not all of them could afford to have orchestras. But
But if you couldn't afford a full orchestra with strings, at least you had your wind ensemble and they could play music outdoors. That was sort of wind music, generally speaking, was written to be played outdoors, or they could provide table music indoors, light diversions and music for various festive occasions at not too great a cost. Because remember, these people all had to be salaried. And if you wanted music, you had to hire it and pay for it. So these were these were full time musicians. Some of them had double jobs. They were employed by the you know local noble person. And and that is the ensemble that Mozart was writing for in Salzburg. His Salzburg divertimenti were actually table music supposedly composed to be played during dinner. And they are splendid, delightful works. They really are. And they show quite an advance over the first 10 wind serenades in terms of their, their the freedom of the instruments in playing solos and blending and mixing colors. They're, they're just lovely works and they deserve far greater, far greater attention than they get. Because, you know, writing music for this kind of heterogeneous ensemble, you know, just oboes, clarinets, and, and bassoons, really takes more work than writing for a homogeneous ensemble, like, for example, a string quartet. And these early Salzburg divertimenti were written at the same time as Mozart's early string quartets. And in a lot of respects, they're better pieces. They're not smaller. They're not less ambitious. And the, the ability to achieve you know, a euphonious sound and create music in large forms using this mixed ensemble shows not only Mozart's young genius, but also, you know, just just how how carefully um, and and enthusiastically he was able to exploit all of the forms of his day without without dumbing them down. You know, there's a lot of wind music out there and a lot of it you know, from the classical period is teensy, teensy, tiny, completely ephemeral, uninteresting pieces. Mozart's are not because it's, it's Mozart. Okay, later, when he gets to Vienna, you get the big enchilada. You get the grand partita. Now, the grand partita is quite simply the largest and most important piece ever written for a wind ensemble. And, you know, the only thing that compares with it are Mozart's two later works for wind ensemble and, and Dvorak's Wind Serenade. That's basically the repertoire for wind ensemble, a major works. So there's Richard Strauss. We're going we're gonna to do a, a talk about some of these other pieces, too. But essentially, Mozart's grand partita is the greatest work of its kind. And that's written for 13 instruments. Um, one of them, which may be a contrabassoon or a double bass or both, depending on how you want to how you want to handle the bass line. But the instruments in that case are pairs of. Let's see if I get this right. Here we go. You ready? Two oboes, two clarinets, two basset horns, two bassoons, four horns. Yeah, that makes twelve. Whoa! I did it. And then your your contrabassoon or or double bass on the bottom, and the grand partitas in seven movements. It's like fifty minutes long. It's huge. It's grand. It's a partita. It's an amazing piece. The adagio from the grand partita is the piece in Amadeus, the movie that supposedly induced Salieri to want to uh, you know kill Mozart. And actually, that adagio was remarkable in a lot of ways because Mozart was not generally an adagio composer. He was more or less an andante composer. What does that mean? His, his pace was a little quicker. But also, also, adagios, as we know from Bruckner and later people, slow music is what we use when we want music to sound somehow spiritual because it has to sound superhuman and not conventionally vocal. Mozart was such a vocal music composer. That's why most of his slow movements are on Dante's. You know, in the symphonies, there's only one poco adagio. There are no other adagios. Haydn wrote lots of adagios. Haydn was a spiritual guy. Mozart was definitely not. And so when he wrote adagios, they tended to be quite special. And so the adagio in, in the Grand Partita which is, I believe, the third movement here. I have like a bunch of recordings of it sitting around. Let me just take a peek. Uh, yeah, th the third movement of the Grand Partita. It's a real tour de force because to write a, a what you might call a spiritual 
piece of music. Um, and for wind ensemble, really, really makes it a tour de force. And it's no wonder that Salieri heard it and thought the voice of God was speaking through Mozart and wanted to kill him immediately. I mean, that's that's a a wonderful, in its way, acknowledgement of the special quality of the music that Mozart plugged into the Grand Partita. But after the Grand Partita, he wrote two more wind divertimenti or serenades, if you want to call them that. And these are for wind octet. You see, they're all a little bit different. That's two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, and octet. And that was, that was you know, with that, Mozart sort of established the wind octet that later composers would exploit, like, you know, Cromer in his, his wind octets, his partitas. And it's a wonderful ensemble if you know what you're doing. <laughs> it's a mess if you don't know what you're doing. Mozart knew what he was doing. And there are two great wind octets. One is in E flat major, and the other is in C minor. Now, the C minor octet is really cool. It's in four movements. It's really symphonic. You know, it lasts about 22 minutes or so. It really could have been a symphony. And, and Mozart obviously loved it. He loved it enough to rearrange it as his C minor string quintet. And I happen to think it sounds better as a wind octet. And the reason I think the wind version is better is because the sound of wind instruments in that gaunt C minor key really has menace. It's much more threatening sounding than, you know, as played by the comparatively softer and more homogeneous string quintet, although they're both beautiful. And it just tells you what a great piece of music it was. And, you know, the idea, other thing it tells us that's very interesting is that, you know, Mozart intended to get his string quintets published by subscription. And so the fact that he rearranged it meant he wanted to save it because there was not much market for published wind ensemble music. It was much too serious a piece to remain a wind ensemble piece. And, you know, a lot of the, the mystique that surrounds Mozart's music um, in general really has nothing to do with, you know, like the Grand Partita, for example. No one knows why he wrote it. And we don't even know if it was ever performed complete in his lifetime. There's no record, apparently, of a performance. But, you know, a lot of what we consider to be the mystery that he just churned out all of this music comes from sheer ignorance. I mean, we just we just don't know what the circumstances were. And if we did know, it would probably be much more prosaic. There was probably a bunch of wind people who got together and said to Mozart, write us a wind piece. There are 13 of us. You can do it. Go ahead. We'll give you 20 bucks. And he did it. I mean, that's how it usually happens in those days. But because we don't really know, that ignorance becomes the mystique of Mozart's compositional fecundity that he just, you know, exuded music all over the place for no apparent reason. But there was always a reason. There's always a reason. People don't work like that for nothing. <laughs> but anyway, I have here a, a slew of recordings that I want to talk to you about and show you. Um, and they're all in different configurations because, like I said, this is a very messy, messy, you know, part of Mozart's oeuvre, his output. And so and so you sort of have to pick and choose what you can find. And there are a lot. I mean, there are tons and tons and tons of them. I mean, one of the sad things is that the Netherlands Wind Ensemble's Mozart recordings are not easy to come by right now, although the box is coming, I'm told. So we'll be able to get them again eventually. But let me go through these. I think I have nine boxes and single single sets of these various pieces just to let you know what's out there. And you could decide what you want, you know, what you want to do. I'm not going to make a big deal of this. One lovely disc is this one of Wind Serenades by the Norwegian the uh, no, uh, the Oslo Philharmonic Wind Soloists, who are superb. They made some beautiful recordings on Naxos. You get two of the Salzburg divertimenti, one divertimento, which is probably spurious and not by Mozart, but it has a Kershaw number, Kershaw 227. And, and so people, you know, sometimes include it and sometimes don't. And that's the problem. There's a lot of misattributed and, and, and spurious music by all the great composers, wind music particularly. But you also get the Serenade in C minor. And I want to play you just a little bit of it. I want to play you just the opening of the Serenade in C minor. So you just get a sense of, of just how, how marvelously dark and creepy it sounds um, as Mozart wrote it. It's a wonderful piece. Have a listen.
amazing that so few people really know this music. I mean, it really is. And the one in E flat is equally beautiful, although it's not included on this particular disc. So let's move from that to the two later wind serenades. That's the E flat and the C minor. That's on this disc with the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, which you may or may not be able to find. And hopefully there's an Orpheus box coming someday because they did all these pieces. They did the Grand Partita. They did lots of Mozart. They did it fabulously well, fabulously. So, you know, it's a tragedy that you can't get it. That's why I'm not even going to like write down these things in the little thing underneath here and these little things, you'll just have to figure it out because I have no idea what's going to be available and what isn't going to be available. And I don't want to make you crazy. You know, I mean, one of the nice things about this repertoire, quite frankly, is that there are probably no bad performances. You can get virtually anything and be assured that they'll be really, really good because we just have fabulous wind players today. And when they do Mozart, they all seem to try and do their best. And most of the time they do. So it's great. There was a wonderful series, you know, with ensemble uh, Zephyro. Remember, they were on Astray and that has seemed to have disappeared. I think it's available as an MP3 download. But, you know, again, these these things tend not to last very long in the catalog because the music isn't terribly well known and isn't terribly popular. For the Grand Partita, which has been recorded 100 million times, um, there are two singleton, somewhat singleton-ish type discs. One is this one, Charles Macaris with the Orchestra of St. Luke's. It's Macaris. It's Mozart. It must be fabulous. And indeed it is. It's on Telarc. It sounds great. This is a great, great disc. Again, these things come and go. I don't know if you'll find it. I don't, I, you know, it's, it's just so annoying that there's no stability. I mean, you know, I could live with fewer recordings if the ones that existed would stick around for a while, you know? Another fabulous, fabulous, fabulous one. This gives you the Grand Partita and the two octet serenades is this one. This is on super fun. It, it, this is the Denon Japanese release. Uh, again, I don't know if this is available domestic in, in, as a regular super fun anymore, but it's with the Czech Philharmonic Wind Ensemble. Oh my God, it's wonderful. And it, you get the Grand Partita, as I said, and the two later Divertimenti, um, if that's what they are, or Serenades or whatever the hell they're called. They're, you know, a, a Partita, a Divertimento, a Notturno, a Serenade, a Cassation, it's all the same. Makes no difference. Why people called things one and not another, um, I, there's, we, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Everyone just called them whatever they wanted to call them. But here it is with the Czech Philharmonic Wind Ensemble on Denon Superfund. And it is terrific if you can still find it. Maybe it's available probably from Denon in Japan still. I don't know. Can't live without it. Now, the rest of these things are collections of various types. And I'm just going to quickly let you know what they are, and we shall move on. First, on Calliope, the Ensemble Philidor. This is sort of, you don't get the two early Dectet Divertimenti, the ones for the 10-piece the wind ensemble, including two English horns, which is a very unusual group. But you do get all the rest. You get the five Salzburg Divertimenti, you get the Grand Partita, you get the two later Serenades, and... You get here, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You get this weird little thing. Mozart wrote something called, let's see, oh, 12 pieces for two horns. I mean, who listens to those? <laughs> and they're on here too, 12 pieces for two horns. But again, this is Ensemble Philidor on Calliope, which no longer exists, but it may still be around. Who knows? Next. Let's see. Oh, yes. Christopher Hogwood did this stuff with the Amadeus Winds, which is obviously the name adopted by the same people who are, like I've said before, the Academy of Ancient Music and the English Concert and the English Baroque Soloists and the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment and the Hanover Band. They're all the same people. They're all the London Period Instrument Mafia. And here are some wind members of the Period Instrument Mafia. Now, in this collection, if you're interested in period instruments, you get the Grand Partita, you get the two later Serenades, and you get four of the five Salzburg Divertimenti, which is really a, a very well well-filled and generous collection on two discs. And if you want to hear period instruments, I mean, the performances are quite good. They really are. 
I, I just, and, and you know, period wins actually don't really sound all that different <laughs> from normal wins, you know, especially in ensembles, you know, maybe a little softer edged, you know, a little gentler sounding, but you know, and maybe the intonation is a little iffier depending on what notes they're playing because their ranges were not fully equalized, but these are usually, you know, modern copies that have been, you know, built to scientific specifications, which of course means they're not authentic at all, but that's okay. Those are nice performances. A wonderful set that's actually, you know, fairly easy to come by still is this thing. This is Carl Böhm, Mozart's, you know, Wind Concertos, Serenades and Divertimenti. Now you don't get all of them here, but uh, you, again, you only get four of the five Salzburg Divertimenti, but you do get the two early ones and you get the grand partita and the two late serenades. And then, you know, the horn concertos and the oboe concerto and the bassoon concerto and the clarinet concerto and the flute concertos. You get both of them. You get the concerto for flute and harp and you get one flute concerto. And, you know, it's just, and then there's the Hofter serenade and the serenata Noturna and the post horn serenade. There's all kinds of stuff in here. It's a really nice box. It's, it's Carl Böhm in the orchestral stuff, but you also get the, the Bläservereinigung der Wiener Philharmoniker, or the Wind Association, our ensemble of the Vienna Philharmonic and the winds of the Berlin Philharmonic. So uh, you really can't do worse than that. That's on Deutsche Grammophon. Also, I mean, it's worth pointing out, aside from Carl Böhm hanging out for this stuff, Klemperer did quite a bit, and he did it really, really well. Klemperer did the Grand Partita, and he did the two late serenades. And it's Klemperer, and it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful with the Philharmonia winds, who were marvelous. And so that's that's in with Klemperer's Mozart stuff, if you can still find that. It's nice to know that he did these things, you know. You know, I, I, again, these these this aspect of the repertoire so often goes unmentioned and and unlooked for, and it's such a pity because it's so great. But if you got the Klemperer Mozart box, then you have these pieces. So do listen to them. You know, it's really worth actually taking them out and playing them. They are marvelous performances, full of character, absolutely terrific. And finally, last but not least, if you want everything in a box, if you can still find it, there is the Consortium Classicum's seven disc complete Mozart for wind ensembles. Now this includes ensembles besides winds. There's, you know, weird brass things. There's stuff that mixes winds and strings. There's stuff, I mean, there's like a divertimento for like horns, trumpets, and timpani. There's all kinds of weird stuff. There's also a couple of discs of, of you know, four divertimenti, probably spurious, and a lot of other things that are, you know, may or may not be by Mozart, all of which go together to add up to seven full discs. Now, this is a lot of stuff. It's really a lot of stuff. I happen to think I like the ensemble Philidor box because, you know, yes, it leaves off those two early ones, um, the Dectets, but, you know, you can get those. If, if, if you have the five Salzburg Divertimenti, the Grand Partita, and the two late serenades in E flat and C minor, the wind sex, the wind octets, you're in business. You're really in business for Mozart's wind music. There is, of course, a limit to how much of this stuff we need and how much we want to listen to. So, so to recapitulate very briefly, there are basically three clumps of Mozart wind music. Two early dectets for pairs of oboes, English horns, clarinets, bassoons, and horns. And then there are five sextets for Salzburg, for oboes, <laughs> horns, and bassoons. And then there's the grand partita for 13 instruments and the two later serenades, which are octets. That is Mozart's wind music. And I, I hope this is just giving you a little taste and a little guidance on where to direct your attention. It is wonderful, wonderful stuff and more than sufficient reason to keep on listening. Thank you, folks. Take care.